Good evening. As the Executive Director of the City Club of Central Oregon and as the Co-Chair of the League of Women Voters of Deschutes County's Candidate Forums, I would like to welcome you to the Candidate Forum for the Republican Secretary of State Primary. This is a partisan race and Oregonians will have until April 30th to change their party affiliation or uh, register to vote on the Secretary of State's website in order to participate. On behalf of the City Club of Central Oregon, the City Club of Portland, the City Club of Eugene, and the League of Women Voters of Deschutes County, we thank you, the candidates, for participating and appreciate the gravity of running for office. Our moderator today is Tim Trainer, editor of the Redmond Spokesman. Tim? All right. Thank you both uh, for participating. I'll give a brief outline of the role you're running for, uh, for viewers and listeners. In Oregon, the Secretary of State is one of three constitutional officers of the executive branch chosen via statewide election. It's also the next in line to be governor should the current office holder leave the position. The candidates here today are running for a four-year term that is limited to two consecutive terms during any 12-year period. Two of the Republican candidates for this important position are with us here today, uh, Dennis Linthicum and Tim McLeod. A third filed candidate, Brent Barker, chose not to attend. I'll lay out some of the basic ground rules here so we make sure everyone gets enough time to speak and equal time to speak. You'll have one minute for opening remarks, 90 seconds to answer each question, and I'll do my duty and rudely interrupt you as your time comes to an end. <clears throat> a timer will appear on your screen and mine while you answer. And when we reach the end of our time limit, each candidate will be given time to give a two minute closing statement. For opening statements, we have randomly selected an order and the order of who answers uh, the following questions will be traded back and forth. So Mr. Linthicum, you won the, uh, won the, uh, coin toss here and you'll go first. So please begin with one minute of opening remarks. Sorry, Dennis, we can't hear you there. See, I knew this would happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, go ahead Thank with you. one minute of opening remarks. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, inviting us here today. It's great to have an opportunity to speak to these constituents. And um, I am currently a state senator for District 28, which includes a major portion of Central Oregon, uh, Southern uh, Deschutes County, Eastern Jackson County, and all of Klamath County. Before the last redistricting effort, Lake County and all of Cook County were also included in my Senate district. I have a background as a trained economist and being a former senior vice president for management information systems, um, I've also actually been a construction contractor board license holder and am currently a rancher uh, engaged in land management and sustainability issues so I bring a wealth of technical and managerial um, expertise to the table, and my expensive uh, expertise in these positions, I think, will be a, provide a great opportunity for me to unlock the potential of individuals within the Secretary of State's office and seize on opportunities to achieve positive outcomes for all Oregonians. Thank you. Mr. McLeod. Yeah, so... Uh, currently, I work in business development and information management systems. However, I have experience across the gambit from, gover for, from governmental to nonprofit to large and small business, which does include small business ownership. Uh, I've had an opportunity to engage the sphere of economy here in Oregon. Um, my background, education background is in a small business, excuse me, my education background is in small city management and public administration with a minor in business administration. However, my expertise continues far beyond the source of my institutional education. So as a result, uh, I am involved currently uh, as the chair of the Republican Elections Committee. Uh, I have had numerous opportunities to engage at the highest state level of uh, executive uh, executive leadership and operations. And I do see this as a role that needs somebody with an experience in innovation, somebody with uh, the ability to communicate through conflict, and somebody who is uh, resilient and able to stand in and manage the difficult challenges to come. Well, thanks uh, for, for those uh, opening statements. Uh, now we'll go to some questions. 
Um, most of these have been supplied from City Club, from the League of Women Voters, and from journalists at EO Media Group. Uh, you'll have 90 seconds to answer each, and we'll flip back and forth. So, Mr. McLeod, we'll start with you. Um, the Secretary of State has many responsibilities, but also latitude for how they spend their time and resources. What would you prioritize if elected to this position? So, one of the things that I have been sharing, uh, to me, it's a priority to focus on our election security. Uh, recent data that was released by the Secretary of State's office pointed out that over a period of 19 years, there have been at least two convictions for election fraud per year. Now, what we don't know or what's not released within that data is how many votes, how many races, how many contests were impacted by those convictions. So I think it's important that we take a very strong look at our election system and engage every opportunity to improve our system. That goes from everything from live streaming voting counts to uh, incorporating better training for clerks offices and volunteers to better security of ballot boxes. I think there's a lot of different things that the right secretary of state candidate is going to be able to look at as well as um, being able to uh, navigate some of the difficult challenges of the political environment that we uh, face today. Uh, as somebody with experience communicating, communicating across a variety of industries and with people across the total spectrum of Oregon, uh, I do feel very comfortable in my ability to, one, manage the most important priority, which is our election system, but also to be able to um, um, pivot out of that and manage some of the other areas needing the attention of the Secretary of State, which also includes uh, a close eye on uh, government spending. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Mr. Linthcomb. Uh, how would you, what would you prioritize if elected to this position? Thank you. Um, as, as has been noted, uh, election integrity is a big issue. It's probably the primary issue for a secretary of state. The, the secretary of state is also the state's chief auditor. So this too is important. And the secretary of state sits on the land board and uh, on a, a sustainable, uh, the board of sustainability. Um, for at the governor's level. But back to the Secretary of State, their focus has been grounded, and I'll put this in air quotes, in transparency, accountability, and fairness. And I would focus in those areas, specifically with regard to election integrity. Here's an issue that I ran mm -hmm. across with regard to transparency. Um, we um, had a request, and I was part of a lawsuit with regard to disenfranchisement. We had a request for ballot images, and the county clerk responded with an estimate for $982,896.17. That's how precise the county clerk can get down to the 17 cents. This is a basically a million dollar tab to get ballot images, which are kept for two years for public perusal. There's nothing transparent about that. And um, I would focus on transparency and availability for the office and office holders that are under the control and um, uh, dominion of the state's election security system. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to question two here, and we'll start with you, Mr. Linthcombe. Uh, the last person to finish this position, or last person elected to this position, did not finish their term. Uh, if elected, what changes would you put in place to limit potential corruption in the office? That, that's a that's a very good question. In terms of um, in terms of the the Secretary of State um, Fagan and her you know, demise, th this was all part of I think a single party rule. And the single party rule notion um, comes from the governor's office through the secretary of state, the legislature, both chambers. I've been in the Senate chamber for a number of years, eight years. And um, what we see is office holders and position holders carrying out what they perceive to be the will of the, um, of the majority party. This isn't what their legislative responsibilities are. This is what they perceive their loyalty and responsibility ought to be. 
And I think what it will take in the Secretary of State's office is new leadership, new insight into what fair and balanced looks like. And how we achieve that is by motivating individuals within that office to exercise their, um, their prerogative to follow legislation and achieve the results that the legislators were trying to achieve versus the results they imagine is what the governor's office wanted or the legislature might have wanted with the legislation they have in front of them. Mr. McLeod, uh, 90 seconds there on what changes you would put in place to limit potential corruption in the office. Well, as the last two secretaries of state administrations have proven, there is a tremendous uh, call to corrupt individuals. Uh, I don't think this is an issue of laws. I think this is an issue of people. One of the traps that I think we as Oregonians find ourselves in is that we uh, we look to uh, we often look to the past. We are not looking forward to new ideas and new people. So as a result, the political landscape is actually very small. Uh, the number of people that are engaged in running for office is very small. But the problem isn't the law. The problem is the quality of people who are, are announcing for office. I've announced for Secretary of State because of that dearth, that dearth of, of quality people who are willing to do the right thing for the state of Oregon. Uh, with that in mind, uh, and with, with all due public scrutiny, I think there is adequate control over the public official's office to strongly encourage them to do the right thing. Uh, if there was none of that pressure, I don't think that Shemaya would have ever stepped down in the first place. I think she was far too comfortable in her corruption. But I think as, as, a, as a broad communication, I think we need to start focusing on better quality of people and allow the law to 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 operate in a way that um, shuts down uh, malfeasance early, but pick better quality people would be my answer. Thank you, Mr. McClellan. And we'll go right back to you with our next question here. Um, give us your evaluation of how Oregon state government is currently functioning, what's working well and what needs to improve. You know, that is, uh, to me, that's a 100% trigger question because, you know, when I look around over the last three years within my community, my very neighborhood, uh, within the span of 100 feet, I've seen two dead bodies, one from murder, one from drug overdose. I mean, li literally, we need to ask ourselves, what is the current leadership doing in any range of the spectrum? If they're currently involved in government, if they're currently involved in our political process, I want to see results. That's one of the reasons why I went ahead and announced for the Secretary of State's role. There is so much going wrong. All of the choices are leading us in a path towards further destruction. And on top of it all, the people are not being listened to. Uh, I feel that this is a situation that can only get worse. Uh, the thousands of people that I've spoken to over the last couple of years are beyond disenfranchised. Many of them have uh, quit voicing their right to freedom at all. Uh, the number of uh, non-affiliated voters that we see in Oregon, uh, one of the major issues with that is that they're completely closed out of the, of the primary process, which means they have no say over who their next leader will be. This is a, a huge issue. Uh, a lot of people choose to, to avoid it to the best of their ability. But what I will say is that we do have hope in the future, and that hope starts with fresh new leadership. All right, Mr. Linthcombe, uh, what's working well in Oregon state government and what needs to improve? <laughs> this is, a, I only get 90 seconds? Wait, yeah. this, you know, uh, I think the Secretary of State's office can contribute enormously to improving the state uh, government. First of all, as um, Mr. McLeod referenced, there's a disenfranchisement of a large portion of individuals who would like to be, have a say, quote unquote, in government. And they don't get a say. And we have about 30% Democrat, 30% Republican. The other 40% are non-affiliated voters. And this is purposeful. This was done on purpose through the Motor Voter Registration Act 
we now see our, we are both Republicans running for this office. We now see in the write-ups for the current Democrats that they want to increase access to uh, validation for registration through the education system, all universities, all colleges, et cetera. And so what we would actually lose is we would lose involvement in this original um, primary opportunity. And I think the Secretary of State should be focusing on auditing the education, the environmental quality, the water resources department in these departments that are disenfranchising the mm -hmm. eastern half of Oregon. Great. Um, I want to bring and stay a little bit on uh, kind of the relationship between uh, state leadership. If you were to win this uh, election, uh, how would your office work with the governor's office, um, who would likely be uh, from another party? Uh, I wonder, Ms. Linthicum, if you can talk about that, your relationship with the Secretary of State's office uh, and the governor's office. Well, there's certainly room for improvement in um, cross-party um uh, communication. And I think one of the important things, for example, uh, the governor just yesterday released a, um, a, a veiled threat to uh, cancel some appropriations that were scheduled project funding that was scheduled for my district. We've got a water quality and a wastewater issue in Butte Falls and Shady Cove. Those are in eastern, northeastern Jackson County. And these are $1.5 million each. So it's not much money, but the governor's um, idea is if this isn't bricks and sticks, if it's not going to create homes, then potentially we're not going to fund it. There's not enough throughput from the governor's office. And I would argue as an economist, if you have fresh water, people will come and build homes. If you have wastewater facilities, people will be able to build homes. Without those facilities, you'll never get the sticks and bricks that you're imagining will have roofs and homes on them one day. And so there has to be more of a frank discussion based on economics the ins and outs of how housing gets produced, and the same will flow with regard to the Secretary of State. That's just a good illustration with regard to the governor's push for housing, but Secretary of State's office lands in the same arena. Mr. McLeod, on uh, your relationship, what should be the relationship be between the Secretary of State's office and the governor's office? Well, because all roads to an election lead through the Secretary of State's office, uh, I think that uh, an appropriate boundary should exist. I don't see anything wrong with being collegial with members of the Oregon legislature. I think that's what the people have sent politicians forward to do. Um, however, uh, I don't believe in backdoor buddies. I don't believe in backdoor deals or backdoor friends. We've seen such a... Uh, we've seen such... Uh, a, an issue with this mentality. It's a mentality that leaves politicians in and people out. Uh, I think that, you know, you know, because of the executive nature of these roles, communication should be constant. However, the governor's office should always be aware that uh, any form of impropriety, uh, which includes uh, mismanagement of public funds, should not be tolerated in any shape or form. You know, right now there's a lot of uh, negative feedback uh, regarding our current governor's decision to open up an office for her for her partner. Um, we have such difficulty um, housing people and feeding people as it is that this is the exact meaning of government waste that I'm referring to. These are things that should be considered strongly. And the secretary of state has a voice to discourage this kind of waste. Thank you. Uh, we'll stay with you, Mr. McLeod. Um, this is kind of an existential question. In many states, Secretary of State is not an elected position. Uh, do you think that it should be? Uh, maybe explain why or why not. And uh, do you think, I guess another part of that is, do you think an elected position should be in charge of certifying elections, even their own? Um, and kind of explain, explain your way of thinking through that. I think that's a great question. And I think it goes back to the quality of people scenario. 
Um, you know, the last two secretary of states, as I mentioned, have both struggled ethically. And as I pointed out in an announcement, this should be a problem for Argonians because the last two secretary of states were both attorneys. Attorneys should be held to the higher standards of our of our law process, of our society. And yet they continue to fall through the cracks. Uh, I have no problem with the position being elected. However, it has become clear that the level of scrutiny needs to be higher than ever. Uh, I think that is that is missing. Uh, just in, it's it's a uh, it's conditionally missing because of the uh, manufactured political apathy that the, a broad majority of Oregonians experience. There's no interest or joy or um, or or self investment that comes from paying attention to politics. In fact, most of what I've seen from politics are uh, very strategic, methodical, subtle ways of silencing people and removing their rights. I think that's where we are uh, as a state right now. So it's not that the position is elected, but it's the kind of people that get into the role and also the level of scrutiny required, especially as it relates to elections, to make sure that our votes stay free and open and honest forever. Mr. Linthcomb, uh, do you think the Secretary of State should be in elected position in Oregon? Right. Uh, it's a good question. I've not thought about it before, um, but uh, the what's interesting about it is the uh, Secretary of State's office needs regulation. It cannot be um, like the local sheriff or the governor's office or the actually even local county officials who make the claim that I'm elected by the people, I report directly to the people, because there is no way to formulate what the people were looking for when they elected you to office. And so that's a that's a run of the mill mandate that gets exercised by uh, mischievous secretary of states across the US where they end up pursuing their own goals, their own um, party favors and whatnot. And we should we should do our best to break that. The legislature should be more responsive. For example, the legislature should have never allowed the Secretary of State to um, create this misinformation, disinformation, malinformation contract with an AI vendor. Everybody who has worked with information systems knows that AI always requires a seed. The seed always blossoms and grows the same thing you seeded the ground with. And for the Secretary of State to seed the ground with these concepts that are basically um, untrustworthy and untimely concepts corrupts the entire situation. So um, the Secretary of State needs to be held to account. And I would suggest there are many ways to accomplish that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Linthcomb. We'll stay with you um, and kind of uh, uh, veer towards elections questions for a bit. Uh, um, uh, former President Trump uh, said mail ballots are, quote, especially susceptible to fraud. Uh, do you agree? Uh, actually, yes, I do. Um, we we see this across the world. Uh, for example, um, France banned mail-in voting in 1975 due to fraud, no doubt. Mexico banned mail-in voting in 1992. Um, let's see, Belgium banned mail-in voting just recently in 2018. Uh, Sweden, Italy, Ukraine, Russia, Japan, none of those countries allow mail-in voting. There's no mail-in vo voting in Middle Eastern companies or in Latin companies, uh, countries. And so we see a lot of people realizing not only is there software fraud or potential for software fraud, but there's also a chain of custody problem. The chain of custody in the Secretary of State's office today, they tear open your ballot. They have a um, they had a barcode that got it into the secretary's office. They tear it open. They separate it. This gets vote the they record that you voted, but they have no idea how your vote actually got recorded. And this is interesting. If you were to call in and say, "Did I vote for X or Y or A or B?" They wouldn't know. They would just say, "Yep, you voted." And so there's a giant chain of custody problem that's associated with mail-in ballots. 
mail uh, balloting by ID in a local precinct where it can be managed by locals within the community is the appropriate way to go. And with an ID is the surest way to ensure integrity. Thank you. Mr. McLeod, uh, do you think uh, mail-in ballots are especially susceptible to fraud? There's no question that they are. Uh, a recent example, uh, during the 2022 election uh, cycle, there was actually uh, an incident where a secure voting ballot box or drop-off box was left unsecured, and you've got ballots blowing down the street. Uh, there are... The vehicle is is what it is. However, I would say that the next Secretary of State has room to, as I said earlier, improve the infrastructure of our statewide voting. This means even moving to a hybrid system gives us the ability to um, funnel more votes to an in-person style method, which also allows the Secretary of State to add additional scrutiny to the mail-in votes as needed. Um, I know that there there have been in, in the last few years, uh, it was either uh, it was either 22, it was between the years of 20 and, and 22, there were about 184 complaints referred to the Department of Justice uh, for the purposes of election fraud. Uh, this is an ongoing issue that, as Mr. Lenthigan pointed out, is 100% chain of custody. Um, there are so many different things to look at in terms of how we can better secure the system, but I don't think mail-in voting itself is the issue. I think we need a hybrid system that supports Oregonians in the times and places where they are, but the election integrity should be central regardless of how the ballots come in. Um, I guess I should ask you, I mean, do you trust the results of election of Oregon elections? We'll start with you, Mr. McLeod. Well, you know, based on my own past experiences as a candidate in the state, uh, there are a number of questions, as Mr. Lithicum can attest to as a as a as a suit to a legal party. Um, I think that it's impossible for me as a as a previous candidate to say with any certainty that the results that that were delivered to the public over the last several election cycles were valid in total. And that's because of the actions of the past two Secretary of State. In fact, there are such strong political affiliations and alliances that we encounter uh, here in this state that it's impossible to believe that either of them have been able to act with uh, with any sort of uh, of of moderate honesty whatsoever. It's just, it's impossible to believe that the way that they were uh, underhanded in their duty, taking advantage of the public trust. So I think that, uh, you know, with the right secretary of state, I think it's important to uh, open up a review of past elections. And I think it's important. There are a number, there is uh, Oregon Votes is an organization that does its due diligence in checking Oregon role, voter rolls. I think the Secretary of State has uh, has a has a role in interacting with independent organizations with an interest in improving and securing the voting system and and develop communication that helps to enhance our secure voting infrastructure. All right, uh, Mr. Linthcombe, back to you. On uh, do you trust the Oregon uh, the the results of Oregon elections? Yeah, thank you for the question. I see sunlight was making my face uh, dark. I'll get back in the light here so people can see me. Uh, the the question is actually a fabulous question because we know discrepancies exist. We know that, like uh, Mr. McLeod was describing, chain of custody issues have occurred. So the real question is, are these known discrepancies, do they impact a large number of voters? Are they big? Are they few and far between? Are they significant? And with the um, veil of secrecy that's been cast over the evidence, we don't know that. Uh, I gave the example earlier where we had a, a estimate of $987,000 for 
accessing public information, that information belongs to the people of Oregon, that information belongs to you and I, that information should be widely available. And so transparency is the weakness of the current single party rule. They don't want you to look for details. They don't want you to know the answers to these complex questions. They want you to be in the dark. And unfortunately, this creates fear among constituencies. They start imagining if they are not finding fraud, they'll imagine fraud. And once that takes off, there's no stopping it because you know the rumor mill in, in, in the Eastern Oregon is every bit as powerful as the rumor mill in downtown Portland. So this transparency issue is a big issue and discrepancies ought to be dealt with in a fast and efficient manner. I will stay with you, Mr. Lumpkum. Um, if, if you have these serious concerns about the, the basic results of elections, you would if you win this position, you would be you would certify elections. Um, take us through. Would you certify an election that, uh, say, an opposition candidate um, it chose one? How, how, wh how would you go through that process? What would you do? Well, well, the process would have to be uh, based on science, based on probability, based on facts, based on all of these kinds of evidence. It's got to be evidence-based. So no detective will ever find a body in the backyard if he doesn't look. So at some point, the public is the best lookers we have. They're out there. They're investigating. You've got people doing the math. You've got people... Um, chasing ballots and understanding how ballot harvesting has been harming the public and disenfranchising lots of voters. And so what we need is we need an individual who's willing to look in the backyard with shovel and pick and look for those bodies. Once you find 32 bodies in the backyard, you can deduce something wrong has happened here and it's time we investigate. So then after that investigation, if you can pin the tail on the donkey, that's exactly where it belongs. The tail belongs on the donkey and we ought to see the results of fraud as it gets uncovered by the detectives within the Secretary of State's office. So here, emotional allegiance doesn't cut it. Party allegiance doesn't cut it. We've got to stick to our uh, franchise as being um, a promoter of the public good through election integrity. Mr. McLeod, yeah, can you explain um, uh, if you have serious concerns about the legitimacy of Oregon election results, um, you would be in charge of certifying them. How would you go about that? Would you do that? So my day to day, I'm sorry, what was that? I would just say, would would you do that? Would you certify an election that you're concerned about? So in my day to day work as a market analyst and researcher, uh, I have to go deeper than surface level to get the answers that I want, especially when it comes to corporate activities. I need to be able to scratch be beneath the surface and dig deep to find answers that have value. This is one of those scenarios. If there is a question of the integrity of the vote, we need to get to the bottom of it. I think it's a travesty that we have any secretary of state who's ever certified an election with a doubt in their mind, unless that doubt was for in favor of their political alliance. That's the only way it makes sense. I think we've seen that a number of times, unfortunately. That's exactly why I've announced my candidacy for this role, because I do believe that not only do I have the skills and credibility, but I also have the ability to operate in a non-biased fashion to provide the results that are fair for everyone. That's what I care about. I don't think that we should continue a process that we know is, is failing Oregonians. In fact, it seems to be failing Oregonians so miserably that the legislation has actually advanced, which will rise to the ballot of star voting for Oregon or ranked choice voting, also known as preferential voting. And that will only make the voting system not only more complex, cumbersome, more difficult to resolve. It's going to open up a host of issues. We're already struggling. We need somebody to stop the madness, to review, make sure that we're certified and that everything proceeds according to what is fair and honest. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is this is these are these questions or answers are interesting. So I want to stay on this a little bit longer, and we'll stay with you, Mr. McLeod. Um, as as you're you know talking about um, 
um, concerns about Oregon voting. Uh, I also I think it's important to say that county election offices um, are feeling uh, strained and uh, attacked and um, inadequately funded. Um, um, how how do you support them? How do you how how do you think um, we can um, you know increase uh, make their jobs uh, easier and sort of um, bring back support um, faith in in local election workers? The secretary of state has everything to do with that. If the people can't trust the secretary of state, how can they can trust? How can they trust the counties? Because ultimately, those votes are fed through to the secretary of state's office. And as I pointed out earlier, regarding unsecured ballot boxes and other issues that Mr. Linthicum and others have pointed out, there are concerns in a number of counties. I won't say that it's in all counties, but in some counties, it seems that the, the circle's a little more closed and it's a little less transparent than others. These are places where we start to see the 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 largest number of issues arise. The Secretary of State has a role to engage with counties to not only make sure that county election workers feel safe, but also helping to provide infrastructure to ensure that they are. But equally as important is to ensure that the votes are protected. That is what really matters here. I don't want to see election workers under any threat whatsoever. But what will protect election workers from threats? is an, an, an integrable, honest voting system. I, as a as a Oregonian, I can accept that a vote doesn't go my way. However, there should never be any doubt in any Oregonian's mind that what they are hearing about the results of a ballot are the truth. Personally, I've experienced that a number of times. We need a strong reversal. We need strong leadership. We need somebody who's not tied in, bogged down to the politics, and is willing to get the work done. Mr. Linthicum, same question to you. Yeah, the, this this is actually the heart of the issue. Um, the see, there's a there's this feeling because of the single party rule, because the governor and the secretary of state and the the two chambers within the legislature are all Democrat projects. They people start to suspect when something's going wrong or right or what, whichever way your left or right brain may um, categorize that information. If we had in-ballot, in-person, with ID voting at the precinct level on a small scale, and you're probably too young to even remember what that was like, where you would go to the ballot you would go to your precinct, you would sign in much the same way an escrow officer would would um, sign your documents, um, you know, uh, for a notary public. And they would say, yep, you're here. Here's your ballot. Go fill it out in private. Return it to this box. This box gets carried to the secretary of uh, to the county elections office, et cetera. All of those are local focused ID focused individual focus collection of information and that collection of information is vital to restoring this idea that your vote counts if you nix the information at the individual level and say we're going to rely on an algorithm in a software machine it's like why are we worrying about algorithm we should be counting votes it's there is no algorithm it's here's one here's another here's another here's another and it's just an adding machine there's no algorithms involved um, I, I think it'd be useful to just, uh, there's plenty of other things to talk about, but I'd, I'd love to give you both 90 seconds to um, say how, if you elected, you would change uh, the voting process in Oregon. What, what would you do? Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Linthicum, and then we'll move on to something else. Uh, starting with me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, so th there's there's very little, first of all, what, what the S Secretary of State can focus on is open access, transparency, um, accountability. Those are things within the office that you can actually focus on. The legislature has to be the one or a ballot initiative from the public at large to actually go to something like uh, remove ourselves from the mail-in balloting fiasco or the electronic balloting fiasco and move to a, um, a more uh, individual intensive area for capturing ballots. 
remember in within the United States, we are all proud as peacocks when you we saw the pictures of the individual on the street that had the purple finger that proved, quote, they voted. And here in the United States of America, especially in Oregon, rarely do we know who voted, who didn't vote. Nobody's proud to vote anymore. They're all doing it under the dark of night and under the cover of, um, uh, you know, opaqueness. We need to get back to that place where people who are interested in the integrity of the founding fathers' ideas are willing to step up to the plate and argue these notions and ideas so that we can advance the idea of individual freedom with personal responsibility chained to each other. They belong to each other. They are chained to each other. You cannot separate those two ideas. Mr. McLeod, uh, just 90 seconds there to sum up. Uh, Before we start, it. I just want to check on the 90 seconds. I noticed that I'm kind of meeting that standard, and I just want to make sure that this is fair. We'll come. In, we'll, we'll keep it tight. Thank you. And what was the question, please? Just uh, sum up your, uh, how you would change the org. If you were elected to Secretary of State, how would you change um, the way Oregon elections are conducted? You know, one of the things that the Secretary of State can do is as the chief records manager, I think we need to ensure that the voting rolls are routinely audited. There's obviously something that's preventing current administrations from opening that can of worms. Maybe they don't like the answers that they'll get when they look, but what's important is that we know who's here and who's voting. These are central to a, a voting system that's honest. Nobody that isn't an Oregon resident should be voting. No one that's died in the past should be voting in Oregon. If, you're, if your address has changed, no address, no ballot addressed from an old address should be received by the Secretary of State's office. These are, these are critical gaps in our current election. Uh, all other issues aside, we must look at this much more seriously as a people if we want to maintain our right to vote. As I pointed out earlier, ranked choice voting, which will come to the ballot this fall, is such a threat to people and their right to, to vote that if that is, and, and it's under threat to be, to be passed up. Uh, the way things stand now, without integrity, without a full and transparent understanding of who's actually voting in our system, where those votes are coming from, terrible laws just like this that benefit exist, current politicians are just as at risk of passing. And we've got to be able to ensure that nothing like that gets by the eyes of the people. Thank you. Uh, we'll transition a little bit now. Um, another major part of the job is its auditing powers um, as Secretary of State. Um, how would you approach that? Are there specific departments that you would prepare to audit? And we'll start with you, Mr. McLeod. You know, so I really don't have a whole lot to say on this. One of the things that I've pointed out in the past is that while I'm not going to be making preemptive declarations, understanding that the audit power is a tool to protect our people against government waste and abuse, uh, I think the right thing to do for a secretary of state is to wield that tool wisely. As a result, what I will say is that any process that were to be opened under my administration would begin internally with the office of the secretary of state. I think that is the right way for any audit process to begin. I don't believe in wielding this as a political tool. However, I am under the strong opinion that there are a number of areas for improvement regarding the way that Oregon tax dollars are spent. I don't think that there's too many people outside of government who will agree with me on that. We can do so much better in the way that we control costs. I think that Previous Secretary of State, primarily being Shamea Fagan and Kate Brown, hesitated for political favors to do the hard work and open up those books and ask those questions and retrieve answers for our Oregonian people. Uh, as Secretary of State, there's no way that I will allow an opportunity to pass in which we can bring back savings to the American people of Oregon. Thank you. Mr. Linthcomb, um, auditing powers, how would you use them? And are there any specific departments uh, you would prepare to audit? You bet. Thank you. Uh, the, the most sensible approach to ensure effective government and accountability, as Mr. McLeod referenced, was to focus on departments and agencies that have a real strong uh, statewide impact. 
Department of Education, Environmental Quality, Water Resources, Transportation, the Justice Department might be another one of those. These departments typically handle significant budgets and directly impact citizens' daily lives. Therefore, conducting um, audits in these arenas would provide the most information or visible fruit with regard to how is um, Oregon competing? How are we performing? What are efficiency, proficiency um, stats, et cetera? So to ensure compliance with regulations, even optimize resource allocation and these kinds of uh, economic factors, you would have to be able to peruse these large departments across a lot of uh, different areas and, and the auditors within the state could easily do this. Um, housing, human resources, public health, these are all arenas that um, dependent populations in Oregon rely on for standing spending tax dollars wisely, and I would focus on those departments as well. Thank you. Um, I'll stay with you, Mr. Linthicum. Um, another part of the secretary's job is overseeing uh, its corporations division. How would you use your, uh, your position um, to benefit Oregon businesses? Yeah, the corporations division is another facet. It follows the same lines, I think, as the audit, the um, comprehensive reviews of these operating, um, uh, uh, what will we call them, regulations is, uh, you know, to provide effective delivery of services. There are statutory guidelines. There's the ability to maintain public visibility and transibility in these arenas, as well in the secretary's own office. And this entire process would um, foster trust and confidence in not only corporations, but the government arm of the, uh, the secretary's office. And so to foster trust and confidence in the what the government is doing requires, it absolutely requires transparency. So this entire conversation keeps boiling down to the same issue. How much information is available? How much is being hidden? How open will government become? How much is behind the secret veil? And um, how will the Secretary of State's office make this um information widely available so that people can see what's going on, how it's being done, and where the resources are being spent wisely or unwisely as it may be. And that's where my focus would land. Thank you. Mr. McLeod, same question to you. Um, how would you use your position uh, overseeing the Oregon Corporations Division? Well, I think one of the things that we can look at is how can we encourage the growth of new business from the role of Secretary of State? I think there's a number of ways that we can look at improving uh, licensing flow paths, uh, website functionality. I think we can review, uh, but, but, but broader, taking a broader look, uh, we really have to look at internal leadership. We really have to move away from uh, the, the government imbalance that we've that we've lived through over what what amounts to the last decade, if not much much longer, based on uh, the foundation of our of our state, um, we are in such uh, an absence of leadership of people willing to take the right risks for the right reasons that uh, we must we have to continue to push where it's hard. Um, the corporate divisions has a role in. In, in managing records, um, as a person who's you know opened up several business licenses here in the state, uh, I can tell you that uh, it isn't always a process that's uh, that that supports me as a business owner. I, I think there are more opportunities within that corporate division to have conversations with our local businesses, asking questions about how the role of the corporate division beneath the Secretary of State better serves the people of Oregon, which includes all business owners. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McLeod, we'll stay with you. Um, another major part of this job is a seat on the Oregon Land Board, which oversees valuable state assets like state forest. Uh, what would your, be, your philosophy be uh, with a seat on that board? Well, quite frankly, I think the priority is to pay attention. I've watched several of those meetings and uh, not only do I not see uh, critical figures showing up, but I see 
items getting passed without a single question asked about what the costs are to the taxpayers, about what the difficulty of the project may be, what the timelines for construction are. I don't see any questions getting asked. I just see, I just see people sitting. Um, I think that as somebody with a background in public works, uh, I'm well equipped to ask the questions on that land development. I'm well equipped to get beyond what surface answers uh, may come up. I think that within that board, we have opportunities to really look at how we improve uh, statewide infrastructure, uh, which does include our forest lands, making sure that those lands are available for uh, recreation uh, and, and other enjoyment uses, um, but that we're also balanced in the way that we approach uh, our policy, how we approach uh, what, what items brought to the board are, uh, are fully considered with the, with the, uh, for the best well-being of, of people. Uh, Mr. Lithicum had pointed out that a lot of times people come into situations believing they have a mandate, but I think more important than to believe you have the mandate is to have the discussions. And as the land board uh, operator, I will definitely have those discussions. Mr. Lithicum, same question to you about seat on the Oregon land board. Thank you. Uh, I have um, for a number of years, not since I've actually been in the Senate, but prior to that, I wrote as the dirt road economist. This was my um, nomenclature. I still own that website. And I um, and as the dirt road economist, I was very in tune with sustainability issues, water issues, forestry issues, land use, mineral rights, all of those kinds of things. And Oregon's economy represents um, a, a, an amazing amount of land use and resource. Um, what do I call them? Their they're, they're potential, but they're not being used as well as they should be used. So this potential is sitting out there and Oregon isn't paying attention to it or using it appropriately. In my area, Klamath County, we just experienced the largest dam removal project in the world. Four dams have been blown on the Klamath River. All of the fish have died. The river is now filled with mud and debris. 22 million dump trucks, 10 ton dump trucks of debris has filled the valley that goes from Klamath County all the way to the Pacific Ocean and nobody's being held accountable and the land board was applauding this issue along with the sustainability board. This is an error. Thank you. Uh, we're getting close to the end here, but I, um, you know, I think it's important as we get through the primaries is that um, your answers are pretty similar to one another. So, um, Fellow candidates who belong to the same party, given similar answers to some of these questions. Why why should voters choose you uh, kind of from among the crowd? There's other uh, Republicans who are not here today. And Dennis, we'll, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I, uh, I have a large, you know, background in expertise in large scale information systems. This legislature just passed a, um, a, a, uh, campaign finance regulatory statutory scheme that will be entirely different. Software will have to be developed and implemented by the Secretary of State's office. My background in large scale um, IS issues leads directly to implementing systems like that. And, and then I've got practical skill and experience that um, most candidates don't have. I and my wife have started several small businesses run small commercial kitchens, run latte stands in the city of Bonanza, or it's an unincorporated city, but nevertheless, and have lived off the grid for 30 years. So I do not have electric power coming to our property because I chose to live off the grid. And so I have insight into what to take to make enough electricity to power a home, to power, I raise my children here, my children are grown and gone. And Diane and I are still here because it is a beautiful lifestyle in the beautiful heart of Oregon. And um, these understanding of sustainability and agriculture and land use are necessary tools to make Oregon productive for our community. Yeah. 
Mr. McLeod, same question. Why should Republican voters choose, choose you in the primary? Well, you know, what is the ongoing challenge of being a Republican in Oregon is that as soon as you hit the general, it becomes a whole different animal. Um, as as I know, um, any candidate that comes out of the Republican primary is going to face uh, unique challenges. Uh, I think that as a Republican candidate, I'm going to be the best equipped to deal with those challenges, as well as develop the coalition of Democrat voters to ensure that a Republican candidate is victorious in this race for Secretary of State. Um, so as a result of that, my background is very different from the other candidates. Uh, I don't come from a background of law. Uh, I don't come from a background of political government. So with that being said, uh, I am a political outsider. Uh, I'm a person that gets up every day and goes to work at a regular job, just like all of the people that will be doing the voting. And so I think these are things that uh, should be considered uh, for a new uh, for new blood in, in politics. I think there are, uh, you know, we already have a number of, of long-term politicians that have uh, operated throughout our state. I think it's time for the people of Oregon to look at who's next, who can uh, bring new perspective, who can hear me on issues and understand my hardships. Uh, as somebody who's lived a life of hardships and been able to overcome them, I am the candidate. I will overcome hardships in the primary and do it in the general as well, bringing home a victory. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Um, uh, we're at the end of our time here, but we want to make sure we give you all two minutes uh, to both uh, make your pitch and make a final statement to potential voters. So, Mr. McLeod, we'll start with you. Two minutes. Oregon, I think we've come from a past where Politicians have gotten their way and they've reduced us to voices that are near silent. New laws are being passed daily that take away our freedoms and limit our voting rights. We need a secretary of state with an ability to resist the wave of changes that are anti-Oregonians. We need somebody who doesn't come from a background of politics, somebody who has the experience and the knowledge, which includes a background in public administration, understanding how these organizations operate, but isn't among them. As your Secretary of State, I will be neutral. I will operate in the best lens of what is needed for the people by having ongoing dialogues with the people of Oregon. I will ensure that our voting system is tighter than it ever has been before, more secure than it has ever been in the state's history. I promise that when the need arises, I will fully execute the need to utilize our statewide audit. And as a person with experience in software and information systems, I will bring new transparency to voting information. I want to, I want to clarify that uh, this job uh, isn't easy. But based on the past leadership experiences that we've seen across our state, uh, I don't feel that there is an existing politician who can do this job better than somebody who has been on the ground floor of a number of organizations, but been able to work their way up through hardship. I'm a candidate who can communicate with people of all kinds, but I do hold true to my values. That's why I'm running as a Republican. I believe in fiscal conservancy. I believe that we have a duty to ensure that taxpayer dollars are not wasted. Please consider voting for Tim McLeod. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Same thing to you, Mr. Linthicum. Two minutes for a final statement. You bet. Um, th thank you for this uh, question. It, it's you're right. We we as Republicans are attached to certain ideas. And, you know, the best answer to the problems we face as a state actually come from the American experience, from the American ideals, from you'll hear um, all different sorts of individuals claim this love affair with the Constitution. And when you think about the Constitution, it's nothing more than the lines on the basketball court. With the constitutional uh, mandate, we know what's inbound and we know what's outbound. And we want to follow those rules. And those rules dictate to us 
what an even-handed nonpartisan office would look like. It's part of the American experience. And um, genuine pride in one's work it, uh, is a derivative of that, regardless of whether you were a uh, foreign born or um, you know recently become a citizen. Um, as early as 1890, 30%, this is a big number, 30% of residents within American cities were foreign born. And we will fast approach that if we're not already there. And yet we have to draw people into this American experiment. You do this as individuals in the private sector, as individual in the um, Secretary of State's office, I will have the bully pulpit where we can talk about these ideas as individuals in the private sector cherish information exchange and free markets. The public sector ought to also cherish that openness and collaboration and transparency rather than resorting to the secrecy that comes from being the gatekeeper for all information that belongs to the state. Um, it's a great opportunity, and I look forward to promoting Oregon. All right. Thank you to both candidates uh, for participating in today's forum. Um, for our uh, viewers here, your vote is your voice. Primary ballots will be mailed May 1st. Make sure to get them postmarked by May 21st so that voice can be heard. Uh, for more information about all the candidates in the 2024 primary election, please check out vote411.org. Uh, my name is Tim Trainer. I'm with the Redmond Spokesman and the Ben Bulletin here in Central Oregon. Thank you to the City Club of Central Oregon, City Club of Portland, City Clubs of Eugene, and the League of Women Voters of Deschutes County, and also the two candidates who joined us today. And thank you all for watching. Take care.